The early Indian hunters called them Zalibu, they who paw the ground in search of food. Inuit and Indians who still depend on them today know them as Tutu or Vitsai. We call them Caribou, barren ground Caribou. Barren indeed is the cold northern land in which they live out their hazardous lives. Since the buffalo disappeared from the prairies, North America has had no wildlife spectacle to equal the caribou. They're timeless, as primitive in their appearance as an animated cave painting. Their nomadic way of life has remained unchanged for thousands of years, almost, but not quite, untouched by human activity. Each year, the caribou make a heroic migration of well over 2,000 miles through some of the hardest conditions on Earth. On the way, they give birth and mate. Some drown, others are crushed by ice or fall victim to wolves, bears and human hunters. So far, enough have always come through to ensure the survival of the species. There are 25 herds of barren ground caribou spread across Alaska and northern Canada. This fine adult bull is one of over 100,000 caribou that make up the porcupine herd. This is the saga of the porcupine herd's endless journey. The Ogilvy Mountains lie in the Yukon Territory of Canada. The herd, which takes its name from the nearby Porcupine River, has spent the winter here. In late April, it begins to move northwards. The caribou don't start their long journey as a large, single herd, but in small parties which feel the urge to travel at exactly the same time. All over the Ogilvies, these little groups are like tributary streams that will eventually join together to become a huge river of animals. The drama takes place along the border between the Yukon Territory and Alaska. The route taken by the porcupine herd varies each year, but its destination is always the same, the rich carving and feeding grounds over 500 miles north beside the Arctic Ocean. The caribou move with a purposeful gait, their heads down, as if they know that they've a very long way to go. This yearling cow is making her first northward trek. All the travelers have one thing in common, in addition to the compulsion to keep moving. They're all cows. Their antlers make them look like males, but caribou are the only species of deer in which both sexes grow horns. The bulls will follow a fortnight later. Sandhill cranes are also moving north to breed. Each of the adult cows is carrying a calf. She must reach the traditional calving grounds by early June, and she has barely a month in which to make the journey. When they're startled, caribou often leap in the air. They do it all along the trail. Glands in their spread hooves leave a strong scent on the ground for those following. This yearling needs no such signposts. She'll stick close to her mother until the new calf is born. Calving is one of the forces that drives the herd north. The other is the need to find the richest possible food to prepare them to withstand yet another winter. To fuel them on their journey, the cows seek out the first green shoots. The snow geese have the same final destination as the caribou, but for them, the journey is far quicker and easier. The barren ground caribou feel as much at home in the mountains as on the tundra. Climbing four to 5,000 feet means nothing to them. Traveling high up has an advantage. The wind has often swept the snow off the high ridges or else packed it down so that walking is easier. So fewer predators on the high ground. The flat open spaces of the valleys are where the wolf packs attack.
caribou will sometimes escape from one wolf, but not from two. Each wolf can kill 18 caribou a year. In the past, the predation didn't harm the herds. Wolves helped to cull the old, the weak and the sick. But now, with human expansion threatening even here, it may no longer be possible to let the old equation work itself out. Some argue that wolf numbers may have to be kept in check if the caribou trails are to remain as numerous in the snow. The hammer blows of spring are beginning to smash the river ice into blocks. When the thaw is just beginning, these small rivers are still fairly easy to cross. By early May, travelling 25 miles a day, the cow parties have covered 250 miles. Now they've reached their first major obstacle. The porcupine herd faces the frozen waterway from which it takes its name, the Porcupine River. When the ice breaks on these Arctic rivers, it can all happen in an hour. One minute the porcupine is a solid sheet of ice half a mile wide. The next it's a juddering, jostling jam of ice blocks, some the size of a saloon car. The caribou must move on, whatever the conditions. They're magnificent swimmers. The hollow hairs of their coats not only protect them against temperatures that would kill a human within minutes, but also help to keep them afloat. Their large splayed hooves, so effective as snowshoes, now act as paddles. But nothing can protect them against the ice. Sometimes an individual manages to clamber out for a brief respite. These hornless yearlings are experiencing the ice crossing for the first time. Many will be crushed or die of exhaustion. The breakup is intermittent, so that every now and then a party of swimmers is lucky enough to strike a comparatively ice-free crossing. But not this swimmer. The ice will all have gone in a few days, sweeping down the porcupine to join the Yukon River on a thousand-mile journey to the sea. But the irresistible urge of the unborn calves within the females compels them to struggle up the steep northern bank even though they're totally exhausted. For a few, either their strength or their sense of purpose runs out. An unborn calf dies with her. Hundreds of young and old will perish on the journey, but at the end, hundreds more will be born to replace them. All that matters is that the vast majority survive to keep the herd up to strength.
North of the Porcupine River, the trees thin out and become smaller. This is the last of the northern forest, the taiga, a Russian word that means little sticks. Soon the caribou will enter the bare world of the Arctic tundra. Though their route varies in detail each year, caribou have an infallible sense of direction. They can find their way unerringly across vast white spaces where a man without a compass would walk in circles. Caribou are close relatives of the European reindeer, but reindeer can be domesticated and make much less heroic migrations. Even a caribou's snowshoe hooves can't cope with the deep, soft snow of spring. The thaw will come quickly now, and with it other signs of spring on the tundra, like a Lapland longspur. The willow ptarmigan are already breeding. The cock keeps his winter plumage long after his hen has turned to nesting drab. He can use his conspicuous snow-white dress to distract predators away from the nest. Even on the hilltops, the snow is clearing fast. All this meltwater has to go somewhere. The speed of the Arctic thaw, which can take place within days, presents the next threat to the porcupine herd. Once the thaw really sets in, a big river can rise 10 feet in a few hours. By the end of the northern half of their journey, the herd will have crossed many major rivers. Most will prove no real problem to them but some will take their toll in lives. This is one of them. The same urge that drove them into the crashing ice blocks of the porcupine now forces them to face rapids which will certainly disappear within a few hours when the river falls again. The penalty for their haste can be death. this casualty is a yearling. By the first week of June, the cows have reached the calving grounds close to the Arctic Ocean. They've come well over 400 miles. This is the porcupine herd's first objective. The long Arctic days can be surprisingly warm, though no one, least of all a caribou mother, should rely on that. 90% of all the calves are born within five days of each other. The first calves are often dropped before their mothers reach the main calving grounds. This gives predators a chance. The fox is looking for a sickly or stillborn infant. With these early calves, the cows are torn between motherhood and moving on. Some calves inevitably get separated and left behind. No cow will accept a calf other than her own. Once a calf loses its mother, it's doomed.
the youngster on the left has temporarily lost its own mother and is soon sent packing. This calf, only hours old, weighed about 13 pounds at birth. On its mother's milk, it will double its weight within 10 days. A calf can walk within an hour of being born. Within three or four hours, it can keep up with its mother. Though the calf will start grazing on its second day of life, its mother will continue to suckle it for a long time, even during the return journey to the wintering grounds in the autumn. The tundra is a wet, inhospitable place to begin life. The caribou calf isn't born in a warm burrow like a parka squirrel. As many as 40% of the calves born each spring will not survive to be yearlings. In exceptionally bad years, the death rate can rise to 90%. The location of the main calving grounds varies from season to season. Some years it's in the Yukon in Canada, but the next year it may be over the US border in Alaska. No one can tell why the caribou choose these particular spots to drop their calves. Often they seem to pick bleak, exposed hillsides instead of the nearby valleys where the food plants are apparently more enticing. But then caribou are mysterious animals, as unpredictable as the north land in which they live. Caribou, it's been said, are the wild spirit of the north land. Four or five days after their calves are born, the cows shed their antlers. This mother, watching her growing youngster flex his muscles, has already lost hers. The treacherous weather of the tundra accounts for a good many young caribou. Out of a blue sky can suddenly come a rainstorm or even a squall of wet clinging snow. Newborn calves caught on exposed slopes by these spring storms fall easy victims to pneumonia. Usually caribou are most attentive mothers. But the presence of a hunting wolverine and her natural urge to keep moving snaps this mother's ties with a sick calf. The cow is apprehensive, and with good reason. The wolverine, or glutton, the largest of the weasel family, has a reputation for being completely fearless. Perhaps the maternal bond is already weakened because she senses that the sick calf is unlikely to survive. As she trots away up the slope, the wolverine is ready to move in. The caribou have only about another hundred miles to go to their final objective. There are no major obstacles to be crossed now, just areas of soft snow, some of which will lie around here all summer. All those tributary herds of caribou are about to flow together into one great river of animals.
The spring flowers and shoots are one of the magnets that draw them all this way. The most nutritious food of all awaits the herds here towards the end of the northward journey. Now there's another dramatic change in the migration. The bulls are coming. The bulls, who started out a fortnight after the cows, come swinging in from the east across the Canadian border to join them. The former slow, purposeful drift is gradually replaced by a feeling of nervous activity. still stop to practice digging for food and to play on patches of snow, but they're not allowed to linger for very long. The porcupine herd's second objective on their northward trek is nearly in sight. Mountains lie behind them now as over a hundred thousand members of the herd, young and old, bulls and cows, together for the first time, turn westward along the coastline towards the Arctic Ocean. Although they're never going to stand still long enough to relax at their journey's end, at least they've arrived. This is the northernmost rim of North America, with nothing beyond it but the pack ice of the Arctic Ocean. To reach this place, the porcupine herd of barren ground caribou have braved more than 500 miles of hardship and danger. The calves are growing fast on the rich food the coastal tundra provides. The adults will recover from the privations of the journey, acquire glossy coats and put on weight. But there are snags to this summer resort. All that standing water produces mosquitoes in numbers and of a voracity found nowhere else on Earth. Caribou do not care for mosquitoes, but mosquitoes are not the only tundra pests. There are warble flies which sting the body and bot flies that crawl up the nose. The animals often crowd together on snow patches because they're less likely to be plagued by insects there. But the flies and mosquitoes still find their targets and often it only takes one badly stung animal to panic and start a stampede. Nowhere except in Africa, on the plains of the Serengeti, can you see such a coming together of large wild animals. Spread out across the tundra are up to 100,000 caribou of the porcupine herd. Sometimes the whole herd packs densely together. But bunched or spread out, even when they're not disturbed, they're perpetually on the move. This area cannot truly be described as a journey's end. Caribou keep moving, using every second of the 24-hour Arctic daylight. Sometimes they're alarmed by an irritant larger than a mosquito. Grizzly bears can be very aggressive and they're totally unpredictable.
This grizzly is only prospecting for anything edible he can find along the edge of a stream, but his presence is enough to make caribou with calves feel uneasy. Among caribou, restlessness is contagious. When the grizzly walks right past the herd, it's too much. A combination of bear and biting flies triggers off another panic. By the end of July, all that's left of the huge herd is a network of trails etched deep into the tundra, trails that have been used for hundreds of years. Scars never heal on the fragile face of the Arctic. The herd has moved eastwards down the coast and will soon turn south with winter on its heels. porcupine herd breaks up into smaller herds and fans out, part of it moving through the mountain passes into Canada once more. Again, it's never a simple, clear-cut movement, and it's different each year. The caribou spend the final weeks of summer feeding and putting on weight for winter. The bulls are now in their full glory. So is the red and gold autumn tundra. If the caribou hadn't taken full advantage of the summer feeding, they could never be in good enough condition to survive an Arctic winter. The willow ptarmigan are changing back to plumage that will soon match the snows, feeding while they can on leaves and berries. Autumn in these parts is like a last chance filling station before a long stretch of desert road. Fail to take advantage of its offerings, and you might die. The mother grizzly will dig a den when the snow comes and pass the winter in semi-hibernation. Her cubs will need a thick layer of fat if they're to emerge fit and vigorous in the spring. The bull moose will remain active throughout the long winter, feeding on scrub willow and birch above the snow. Food will never be as plentiful or as accessible as it is now. Hanging from his antlers in shreds is the last of the membrane called velvet that protected them as they grew. To clear the velvet from his own rack of antlers, a caribou bull will look for a bush and thrash them against it. Bush thrashing serves two purposes. It cleans the remains of the velvet from the new antlers, which the bull grows afresh each year, and it stimulates his body to reach breeding pitch for the rut which lies ahead. Even though they're too immature to breed, the young bulls are the first to go through the motions of the breeding ritual. The older bulls, sure of their prowess, waste little energy on unnecessary demonstrations. They're saving their strength for the real thing. These are the adult bulls whose rutting combats will shortly decide whose genes are to dominate future generations of the porcupine herd.
The herd reaches one more river on the long road south to the wintering grounds in the Ogilvy Mountains. The rivers now are comparatively friendly, with no swollen spring floods. But with the autumn come other dangers. On their journey south, they return at last to the Porcupine River. There is no ice this time. Instead, there is an Indian settlement called Old Crow. The herd approaches the river crossing, led, as usual, by an adult cow. Among deer, such as caribou, mature females are usually the most cautious. The porcupine herd has crossed the river near this place for as long as Indian tribal memory can recall. The caribou are in danger here, but it's a threat they seem unable to learn to avoid. An outboard motor is not a traditional Indian sound. Yet Dick Nukon is a traditional Indian hunter. His people, along with the Inuit of other Arctic regions, have hunted caribou ever since their ancestors first crossed the vanished land bridge from Asia. Caribou are to them what the buffalo was to the Plains Indian, a provider of meat, clothing, and in the old days, homes and weapons. Elsewhere, the deer have often failed the hunters by changing their migration routes so that Inuit and Indian villages have gone hungry. Here, they can be relied on. The Indians of Old Crow settlement on the Porcupine River still depend on the coming of the caribou. Dick Newcon's extended family will need more than 20 caribou to provide for the coming year. Dick Newcon is a hunter of the old school, brought up to shoot only what he needs. He always tries to pick out the bulls, which will be quickly replaced by their rivals, thus maintaining the breeding rate. Also, the bulls carry the most meat and fat. Fat is a vital commodity when you live in a frozen world. In Old Crow Village, the caribou meat that the hunters have harvested hangs drying in the autumn sun. More meat will be smoked, and later some will be frozen. There are few restrictions on Inuit and Indian hunting. The American and Canadian governments recognize that the caribou is the mainspring of their native people's way of life. But where these people once hunted with bow and arrow, they now have repeating rifles. Where once they followed caribou on dog sled and snowshoe, they now use motorized snowmobiles. Not all the Indians show the same restraint as Dick Newcomb. Others retain the old hunter's attitude to the caribou. Get the meat while you can. The question now must be, can the caribou withstand this modern hunting pressure from an ancient people? Even more urgent, can these people keep their traditional way of life in the face of a more recent and ruthless culture? In finding a solution, the caribou may be the loser. Within sight of Old Crow Village, another segment of the still vast porcupine herd crosses the Porcupine River. This party has made the crossing undetected by hunters.
fine young bull still has unshed velvet hanging from his antlers in tatters. Ahead of him now lie the rigors and stresses of the rut. He's in the full vigor of youth, but not all the members of the herd are so fortunate. In every group that crosses, there are the weaklings and the casualties. Wolves, wolverines, sickness, and natural obstacles weed them out one by one. In this party, there's a young bull with a broken leg. Another casualty is an adult bull who has already been mauled by wolves. Nature finds a way of eliminating such casualties. The sow has cubs, and she sees the wounded bull as easy meat. A bear would have difficulty in taking a healthy bull caribou. The fight was over in seven minutes, but the grizzly and her cubs returned to feed on the 350 pounds of caribou meat for the next five days. Untroubled by the disasters which have overtaken their companions, later parties of the porcupine herd continue to make the river crossing and press on southward. Though they're still north of the Arctic Circle, they're back amongst the trees now. The tundra is left far behind. Ahead lie their wintering grounds in the Ogilvy Mountains. So far, their long trek has been dominated by the needs of the cows. Now, very soon, the time of the bulls is coming. Like everything else on the caribou's long march to the Arctic Ocean and back again, they take the rut in their stride. The herd never stops long in one place, whether it's to feed, give birth, or mate. But when they're rutting, just as when they give birth, they use the same general area year after year. It's south of the Porcupine River before they reach the mountains again. There, the bulls start to work up their ardor by thrashing the bushes with their antlers. They don't control whole harems of females like European red deer. Instead, they chase around seeking out any cow that's in season. Rival bulls passing each other display their antlers as a threat. Cows are in season all at the same time, but only for four or five days, so the bulls can't afford to waste any opportunities. Incidentally, this explains why all the calves are born eight months later within four or five days of each other. The tension among the bulls steadily increases. Mature bulls repeatedly turn their heads to show off their white manes to the cows. Mm. 
young bulls who haven't a hope of mating success this season are still going through the rituals of courtship combat. Tension builds up to such an extent that it takes very little to alarm the entire herd. The sudden appearance of a grizzly is often enough to start a stampede. Grizzly, engrossed in the urgent business of building up fat for the winter, may not even be responsible for the panic. It may simply be caused by the nervous behavior of a cow caribou being pursued too ardently by a bull. This head-high threat posture is the one the bulls adopt when they're pursuing a cow that's in season. often abandon courtship momentarily to chase off a passing rival. Fights between mature breeding bulls are not just ritual affairs. Caribou battles are in deadly earnest. The object of the encounter seems to be to twist the opponent, forcing him off balance. Antler wounds are common, and just occasionally a bull dies in combat. Strangely enough, the loser doesn't seem to be driven away from the herd. Quite often a third bull takes advantage of the contestant's preoccupation. For the bulls, the rut is an extremely exhausting time, especially as they have little or no opportunity for feeding. A loser might move off to the fringe of the group, but he's likely to start chasing a female or fighting another bull almost immediately. By the end of October, the rut is nearly over. Winter has traveled southward faster than the caribou, and now it's overtaking them. The grizzlies dig for roots. Soon they'll be excavating dens in which to escape the worst of the coming cold.
caribou are moving back now into their wintering grounds in the Ogilvy Mountains. The last rivers they cross are already close to freezing. Even extreme cold doesn't trouble the caribou. Their autumn coats of long, hollow guard hairs and dense underfur protect them completely. The long trek of the porcupine herd is apparently over. And yet it's never over. Even when they reach the mountains, they'll keep moving all winter long until it's time to start north again. It seems a wasteful system, but it's worked for thousands of years. Winter fills the passes. The Indian named this animal Zalibu, the one who pours the ground for food, with good reason. Strong from the rich feeding they found on the borders of the Arctic Ocean, the barren ground caribou survived the winter. The force that drives the herd on its annual journey of about 2,000 miles is the need to find the best possible feeding all the year round. It's a powerful force, moving an animal as wild and mysterious as the empty spaces of the barren lands themselves. Empty spaces are what the remaining herds of caribou need to survive. Yet even here in Alaska and Arctic Canada, such spaces are threatened, if not doomed. Already the Alaska oil pipeline crosses the tundra, and networks of roads are planned. A highway and a gas pipeline through the winter range of the porcupine herd is likely in the near future. The caribou is too wild to adapt to such human intrusions. When the Indians wished to drive caribou for hunting, they laid a trail of logs on the ground, knowing the caribou wouldn't cross them. Now, when engineers provide caribou with underpasses and bridges at roads and pipelines, the herds turn aside and will not use them. Without their freedom to migrate, they're lost. The question must now seriously be asked, for the barren ground caribou is the end of their endless journey tragically in sight.